even though that experience wasn't great for me, I would still recommend the Warner Brothers writing program to people because it's it's an in. So great, you know, for us, it worked out well. We, we didn't have to make a third of our salary and we got to be on a great show. But for, for somebody else, it's still a better opportunity than none at all. You're listening to Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jamin. All right, welcome everyone. Today we're talking about different paths to break into Hollywood because you all want to break into Hollywood, right? Yeah, that's um, the goal. That's the goal. So there's just so many different ways. I get people say, well, how do I get in? And there's, there's really no, obviously there's no one way. It's not like becoming a doctor where you go to med school and that's what you, you know, eventually you become a, 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 I guess you become a resident and you an intern and then, you know, you, you, you work your ways and as a, become a, a physician or a surgeon or whatever. There's no one way, and uh, which is good, but it's a little, it must be a little frustrating too for people. Yeah, I, I would say that this is, you know, if I go back to like 2000, I've known I've wanted to be a writer since I was like 12 years old. Um, but when I go back and think about when I first started seriously studying screenwriting, that was, uh, I was trying to learn how to write a screenplay. I was learning formatting. I was using my software and using, like figuring out how to do all that stuff. But the majority of my time was, how do I get an agent? How do I break into Hollywood? What do I need to do to work in television or film? Yeah, and and even like thinking about like, let's see, like let's see. When I when I I wanted to be a TV writer when I watched Cheers, and I thought back then, this is how little I knew. I was in high school. Well, maybe if I start out as a grip, I can work my way up to writer. Mm. Like it doesn't even work that way. You, you and, knew what a grip was. At least I didn't. I I just saw that name. I didn't know what a grip did. But obviously, and it's not even that's not even working your way up. Like people, that's their job, and they're happy. They don't want to be writers. They they want to be grips. That's what they that's what they want. So it's not like working your way up. It's not like grips below writer. Like that's like, right. that's crazy. Um, but and so and then some people think, well, I just have to get an agent, and the agent will get me work. It's like no, the agent doesn't want to have to work for you. The agent wants basically wants you to do the work yourself and take ten percent. That's every agent. They want to you know they don't want to have to hustle. They want someone who already is hustling, and they can just make money from. And like, well, that doesn't sound right. Well, but if you were an agent, you'd want the same thing. You don't like we all. No one wants to work hard. They want they want something to come easy. So the agent, the same thing. The agent wants to have someone who's just on the cusp of breaking in. So there's a number of ways that people talk about, and I think one way we can talk about. Uh, that I think a lot of people put a lot of time and energy into our, our screenplay contests. Yeah, screenplay contests, film festival screenplay contests, and um, pitch fests are kind of the big three things that. I see a lot of people in your group, as well as you know, other writers I know, and things that were recommended ways to break in. Mm -hmm. We're doing these types of things, and you know, I'm sure we're probably going to get a lot of flack for this from the people in these industries if we haven't already at this point with some of the podcast content we've put out. Um, but it does not seem, from a professional perspective, that these are venues and avenues to get into the industry. Yeah, I don't want to. I, I talked about we talked about this a couple of days, uh, a couple of episodes ago, so I don't want to hit on it too much. But yeah, I mean, it seems I'll just real fast say like, if you were, there are these festivals or pitch fests where like they'll take unknowns and let you pitch to Hollywood insiders. So just think about it from the other way around. If you were a Hollywood ins insider and you wanted to make a, have a project put up, you had money to make a movie or a TV show, like why would you go out to an unknown? You just put a call out to a Hollywood agent. Hey, I want to get a show off the ground. Uh, send me some writers. Like you wouldn't go, you know, you wouldn't go to a pitch fest you take yeah. you want a professional why would you want an, you know, an amateur someone who hasn't done it before now this is something i'm thinking about that i've not thought about in a while but one of the best classes i had in film school was actually taught by my buddy rich he was he became my friend after um but he had a class it was like the business of film and television mm -hmm. and he would bring in industry professionals who were working in new mexico at the time or visiting because they were shooting a show in new mexico he would bring them in and we'd spend an hour and he would interview them for us. And I thought it was probably one of the most valuable things because you're hearing these people talk about what they look for. And at the end, he would give us an opportunity to pitch if that person was a producer, if that person was a director. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of times I'd pitch something and afterwards those people would come up to me and give me their cards and say, I would love to read your script. Right. right? Now nothing came of them. And five, six years down the road, I understand why. I just wasn't ready. The script wasn't good enough to produce. Although the idea was good and enough, good enough to get them interested, the execution wasn't there. Yeah, it's all about the execution. Yeah. yeah. So so I definitely have seen that happen at some 
lower film festivals as well, where you sit down and you sit with these industry professionals. And I think there's a lot of value in meeting those people, but it's typically those people are independent producers and independent directors, and they're out trying to get their stuff made just mm -hmm. as much as you are. They're hustling as much as you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're not going to, they're not in a position to set you up really. Right. Right. Then there are other programs that like, let's say like Warner Brothers has like our Warner Brothers writing, writing program. Like that's yeah. different. Uh, and D Disney has like, like fellowships and stuff like that. And those are definitely worth pursuing. And those could be a great entryway. And to... you won, you and the, your writing partner won the Warner Brothers. Warner no, we didn't win. We we got into oh. the, we were accepted to the Warner Brothers writing program. Where... I, I call that a win personally. Like, but yeah. But this is how it was. And this was many, many years ago and things have changed. But basically what you did back then was uh, you get accepted, which is which is hard. It's hard to get accepted. And then you have to pay Warner Brothers. I think we paid maybe $400 each or something. I'm sure it's a lot more now. And we paid Warner Brothers for the right to be accepted to this class to sign. And, and if you were to, the top graduate of this class, uh, you would they would try to place you on one of their shows. And back then, Warner Brothers had a ton of sitcoms. Like they had a, they had, they just had like the Friday night block. They had so many shows that it was like, the odds were not terrible. Like they would try to place you on one of their shows. But if you, if they did, because you were a graduate of the class, you would be earning, the contract said you'd earn like a third of Writers Guild minimum. It was something mm. like, something really terrible like that. And so here, only in Hollywood, do you pay to have a contract, to sign a contract that gives you a third of what everyone else is getting paid. And, and you're paying that's, for this terrible contract. Like that's, that's crazy. That's fascinating. But I think that speaks to the competitiveness of this industry. Yes. Yeah. Everyone thinks they have a good story idea. Everyone thinks they're a writer and it's so competitive. You're literally paying people for opportunities to work for less money. It's insane. Yeah. And then we didn't, it, what happened was that class, you know, there, I'm, I remain friends with several people from that from that 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 core group of people. There were maybe 30 or 40 of us, and only a handful went on to actually become professional writers. Everyone else kind of flamed out at one point or the other because uh, it is hard to break in. But um, you know, we were I, I do remain friends. But they they chose a golden child. There was a golden child who was chosen pretty early. The executives of the program, they I think they decided that's the golden one. That's the one who will get work. And everyone else is like, what, but, 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 and, and so pretty early on, it was my partner, I can, could tell that, um, that we were not going to be the golden people. And so we were not chosen when we graduated the class, they didn't try staffing us. It just so happened that our script, uh, Matt, our, that we had a script that was read, um, by the, by Steve Levitan, who was at that time, the creator of a brand new show called just shoot me. And he read our script because our, because his assistant read it and liked it and passed it on to him. And so he hired us. He goes, Hey, yeah, we want to hire, I want to hire you uh, to be on, just shoot me. And then we had to go back to, so we tell the people at Warner Bros. Yeah. So, the, you know, our contract is up and they're like, well, well, not so fast. Now that, now that Steve Levitin's interested in you, let's see if, let's see if we can get you on one of our, ta you know, crappy t TV yeah. shows and pay you a third. And then, so we basically had to bribe our way out of that contract because uh, you know, suddenly, suddenly they were interested in us, but only because someone else was interested in us. But before, before that, they were not interested. Yeah, this is like the the guy girl situation where the, the girls overlooked until someone else is interested. Yeah. All of a sudden, my eyes are open, and I realize I never realized what was right before me this entire time. Yeah. Except in this case, it's motivated by dollars. Yeah. Right. And so we got out of that. That that was that made it was history for us. Like, like okay, great. Now we're in just shoot me. Now we're basically set us off on our career path. But so that, but even still, like, you know, it, even though that experience wasn't great for me, I would still recommend the Warner Brothers writing program to people because it's, it's an in. So great, you know, for us, it worked out well. We, we didn't have to make a third of our salary and we've got to be on a great show. But for, for somebody else, it's still a better opportunity than none at all. I don't see that any different than, you know, I talked about the Writers Guild Foundation and this golden ticket that they have mm -hmm. where you get invited to every single event, guaranteed seats. You just RSVP to say you're going to be there. They have your name on a seat. You show up front row and you have extra opportunity to interact and network with these people. And I met some amazing people. There was a guy from Canada who was down here. They were shooting the pilot of his show. I sat next to him at an event, talked to him. He asked for my script. He read my script. He sent me notes that were very helpful. That's right. Nice. So, so I don't see it any different. It's again, it's an investment in yourself. You're just yeah. taking that opportunity. And, and I want to point out here too, because 
you know, there are a lot of people in your social media and I see the kind of mindset, well, I don't have any money. I work as a PI, I barely get by, et cetera, et cetera. Look, ultimately it's about making sacrifices and sacrifice, yeah. you know, the way we define it from a theological perspective is to make holy. Like you're taking something to make what? And you're, to make holy. holy. Right? Okay. I'm giving oh. up something because I find this other thing more valuable. It is more sacred to me. Okay. So if you from take sacrament. the approach, right. yeah. So if you're taking the, the approach of my writing career is sacred to me because it is literally why I am here on this planet is mm-hmm. to be a writer. Then stop drinking Starbucks for a month. Yeah. Seven bucks a day times 30 days. It's a lot of money, right? Yeah. Even if it's only once a day, once a week you're going. Yeah. That stuff adds up. There are ways to win in the margins, as we say in the in the accounting world. Yeah. Like you can win in the margins and, and save up and you can get a license to final draft and learn how to do that so you can be a writer's assistant. You can afford these golden ticket opportunities. The, that I think is just you approach it as you have a war chest, there's funds there, and it is to be invested to help me pursue my reason for being on the planet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that and and so I've worked with so many inspiring people who couldn't get a break. So they made their own break and that's how they got into Hollywood. And I, I, I'll, I'm going to list them because they're all incredibly successful people. The first one was Mark Marin, who yeah. he had a show on IFC and my partner receiver and I, we, we ran that show for four years. And Mark is an interesting guy because he was a, he was a comedian and he worked for a while in, in radio. And then I think he got, I don't know if he got fired or he left radio or whatever, but um, he was basically cold. He couldn't book rooms. He was cold. And so, but he's a creative type and he had to create. And so this is back then, he, there was a thing called podcasting. No one knew what podcasts were. And it was just a forum for him to talk into a microphone. And God knows if anyone was going to listen, but he was going to put on his little show and, and uh, interview people. And he's, really, you know, he's good at interviewing. And, uh, and that was it. But no one knew how he was going to monetize, but he just did it. Because he, you know, he was putting putting himself out there, and eventually that podcast. And his is one of the one of the most successful podcasts out there. It's always in like the yeah. top five on Apple. Yeah. He interviewed Barack Obama yeah, in his garage. In his yeah. garage, the president, the president was in his the garage. President of the United States came here and went to someone's garage to be on a podcast. Yeah, and because that podcast blew up, uh, Mark. His, that reignited his comedy career and it got him a chance to get a, a TV show on IFC. That was the one we ran called Marin. And because that show kind of did really well, it got him on Glow. And then because of Glow, he gets all these other opportunities. Yeah. But it's not because he was begging Hollywood, let me in. He's like, screw it. I'm doing, I'm making something worthwhile and I will build an audience that way. What it summed up as he provided so much value, people couldn't ignore it. Yeah, right. And he did, right. He just created on his own, but he made it his creation good. The same, another example, um, were Rhett and Link. So Rhett and Link were these two guys. We ran their show, which you worked on. Uh, uh, and they had a show on YouTube, Red, and it was a sitcom. But they're not com- they're not TV writers, so they needed to have, uh, they created the show, but they needed showrunners to actually write the episodes and kind of do all the, the that, that work. And so they hired me and my partner to run their show. But who are, who's Rhett and Link? These yeah. are just two guys out in, I think from North Carolina, they just, like they were just two no ones who started a YouTube channel. Um, and that was it. They did. And it, it, this is before YouTube was really a big thing. They just started putting up these shows and they, and they, these, they're best friends. So they have good chemistry and they just kind of do wacky things. They would sit in a giant vat of oatmeal and do kind of like kind of little mini contests with each other. And they had good chemistry. And that show kind of blew up and became so big on YouTube that YouTube said to them, Hey, you guys are amazing. Uh, we'll give you your own TV show. And but it wasn't like they weren't beg. They didn't beg YouTube. They just did their own thing, and Hollywood came to them. And there's so many instances of Hollywood. Instead of people begging, to, you know, please Hollywood, let me in. They create something so amazing that Hollywood comes to them. Yeah, I think you could look at Joe Rogan. I think you could look at most of these people. I mean, you can split it off and it goes back to what we talked about in another podcast about niching down and finding your niche and owning mm-hmm. that. Like yeah. that's really how you break through these things. Those There's guys a, were more advertisers and marketers yeah. and they, they leveraged that medium to make fake commercials. They do free commercials for businesses and mm-hmm. they were so wild. That's how they broke through on YouTube early on. Yeah, because they were doing, no one was paying them to do this. 
No. Right? They just did it on their own. There's a woman over who I discovered at the beginning of the pandemic named Sarah Cooper. And I, I found her on, I think, Twitter, but she was probably on all the platforms. And she would just basically, she was a struggling actor, comedic actor who could not get arrested. She couldn't get anything, any kind of work. And so she said, screw it. And so she would basically take these speeches that Trump would make and kind of lip sync it, but wasn't, she was doing more than lip syncing. She was adding uh, her own personal touches and making it funny and doing things in the background and her funny facial expressions really plussed it. So it wasn't just like standard uh, lip syncing. She really, she put a lot of craft into it. And because these things were so good, it was like, she was on, you know, everyone had to notice her. You could, you could not watch this and think, wow, like it, it was amazing her skill and her talent that she brought to it. And because of that, she became, she became so big that Hollywood came to her and gave her a Netflix special. Or, and then they gave her, I think it was a show on CBS, a pilot that I didn't think it got to air, but she got all these opportunities uh, because she just was like, screw it. I'm going to be the master of my own domain here. I'm going to, I'm going to do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's seizing the opportunity. It's the old saying, fortune creating one. the bold. Yeah. Yeah. Creating an opportunity. And there's so many people like that. Another woman, Blair Erskine, I think, I think that's how I pronounce her name. And I just discovered her on, uh, on, uh, she would make these kind of funny, uh, videos on Twitter and they, but they were so good that that got discovered. And eventually I think she's now a, uh, a writer on Kimmel. Like that's how mm. she broke in and she was not begging anyone. She's like, screw it. I'm going to do it myself. But it was, yeah. the content was good. Hi guys, Michael Jammin here. I wanted to take a break from talking and talk just a little bit more. I think a lot of you guys are getting bad advice on the internet. I know this because I'm getting tagged. One guy tagged me with this. He said, I heard from a script reader in the industry. And I was like, wait, what? Hold on, stop. My head blew up, I blacked out. And when I finally came to, I was like, listen, dude, there are no script readers in the industry by definition. These are people on the outside of the industry. They work part time. They give their right arm to be in the industry. And instead, they're giving you advice on what to do and you're paying for this. I mean, that just made me nuts, man. These people are unqualified to give my dog advice. And by the way, her script is, is coming along quite nicely. And oh, and I'm not done. Another thing, when I work with TV writers who are new on, on writing staffs, a lot of these guys flame out after 13 episodes. So they get this big break, they finally get in, and then they flame out because they don't know what is expected of them on the job. And that's sad because, you know, it's not going to happen again. So to fight all this, to flush all this bad stuff out of your head, I post daily tips on social media. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook at Michael Jammin Writer. If you don't have time, two minutes a day to devote towards improving your craft, Guys, it's not going to happen. Let's just be honest. So go find me. Make it happen. All right. Now back to my previous rant. So let's say that you're a writer and you're not like an on-camera talent. You don't necessarily care to put yourself out there that way. There might be some trepidation. You know, for me, I have um, uh, an agent and I get auditions all the time and I have to self-tape. And I get just tremendous anxiety every time I have to be in front yeah. of the camera. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just something I'm working through and I, and I do it and I force myself to do those things because it's something I want to do. Um, but let's say I'm not, let's say that I'm just, you know, someone who wants to rise up through a traditional route and let's say I'm a PA, right. what kinds of things do you think make a PA stand out to forge that path or create their own path? You know, we, we've taught, you're, I think an excellent example of this because you always say yes. When someone has a question or a problem, Yes, I will fix it. I will take care of it. No, that's, relax. It's done. I'm already, it's already done. Relax. And yeah. so there are a number of instances I can think of you where, especially when it comes to tech, when it comes to something computer related, because you would know so much about that. If a writer is having a problem with their computer, like you will show up. I'll, I'll fix that for you. I will take care of And you'll, you, I, maybe you'll, you'll expand on, on that a little bit more, but um, it's offering, what else do you offer? So even if it's not writing stuff, you offer these other skills that you have and you offer them freely, and because of that, you endear you endear yourself to people, and people want to help you in exchange for that. Yeah, and I, and I think that it's an important note here too that when I do that, it is sincere that I just want to help. I am not doing it with any expectation that something is going to come from it. Right. It is that I understand that the best way for me to stick around is to be so valuable that I am invaluable. I, right. I, I'm, right. I. They want me around because I solve so many headaches for them. And you weren't and, charging. You weren't, you weren't saying, hey, this is outside of my pay grade. I should get paid extra for this. You're like, no, uh, I, I will gladly do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, I view it this way. Like, I'm not a member of a union. 
there are no union rules dictating what I can and can't do. And so I have opportunity now to over serve people. Then let me let me jump in here, Phil, because yeah. a lot of people don't know how you and I met. So we we've known each other probably since maybe 2010 or 10, something like that. 10. 10, yeah, probably 10, 11, somewhere in there. So you were a stranger to me, and my wife has a, a business, an online. Uh, she sells, she, she manufactures girls' dresses called Twirly Girl. And so she, at the time, needed to build a website. She found a company that was going to build a website. It was kind of a custom made site. It was. We found this custom place that over promised and under delivered, and uh, and Phil was working there, and I maybe I don't want to tell the story wrong, but this is how I remember it is. Cynthia, my wife, was really kind of distraught. It was like, well, we paid all this money and you're not giving us what we want. And and you got, at some point, I don't know how, you got on the phone. You were I can a- tell you how. So I was in sales at that company at the time and I kind of saw the writing on the wall that they were going to downsize my department. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to be there. What I wanted to do was work with the guy who was teaching all the things I was selling. And he ran the other department, the account management department. So I went in and applied for a position there. I got hired. And they transitioned me to account management and your account, your wife's account was the first account I was handed. And they were like, we're giving you this account, do whatever you need to, to make this person happy because Mm -hmm. the sales rep oversold them to like, to a a far extent, promised way too much. Right. And so that's how I got on the phone with Cynthia. And then from what I remember, we were pretty pissed and you're like, listen, I can't, uh, and this, I, you were over promised and under delivered. I'm going to fix this as best as I can on my own, on my own dime. That's how I remember it. I will do yeah. whatever it takes. And because I just feel bad, I want to make this yeah. right for you. Yeah. It, it ultimately ended up being some nights and weekends. And, you know, I remember one experience where I got a call from your wife and she was in tears because she mm-hmm. had accidentally deleted like a fat chunk of your website. Right. And I was actually up at Sundance where I was volunteering because that's how I was in the industry at the time. Right. I just needed to be involved somehow. And I come down off the mountain, and I've got this voicemail from Cynthia, and I call her back, and she's literally in tears because she thinks she has just deleted half of her website. Yeah, I remember that. And I was, yeah. and I was like, I was like, I promise you, like, we're gonna figure this out. I don't know what we can do, but let me see what we can do. And so, because I took the same approach at work too, where I would go in to the engineering department and I would say, "What do you need from me as a sales rep to make your job easier?" And then as an account manager, what do you what do you need me to get you so that you can be as efficient as possible? Mm-hmm. I called one of the engineers on a weekend and I said, hey, look, this client has made this mistake. Do we have any old versions? And he was so ingratiated to me that he got in on his time on a Saturday night at like 10 o'clock at night, found the old version of the site and restored it over the weekend for right. her. And so in that, and you were a hero and you fixed it right away because of... And so because of that, now my wife felt indebted to you because you had done this great thing, you know, and you made her stop crying. In this but, but at the same point, to be clear to everybody listening, I have no idea who Cynthia is. Right. I have never talked to Michael at this point. Right. I just know here's someone who was sold a bill of goods that, they, that we couldn't honor and I needed to do anything I could to feel ethically okay about right. this. Right. And so Cynthia says over the next couple of weeks or whatever, she's talking with you and you somehow the conversation turns to what you want. You want to become a TV or a screenwriter. It, it, it was actually, she's like, Hey, my, my husband, Michael's going to get on while he waits um, for his next show to start. And I was like, Oh, show. She's like, Oh yeah. He's going to be running Mark Maron's new show. Right. And I was like, okay. And that's when things kind of clicked. And so we ended the call and I Googled her name and an IMDB page shows up and I was like, Oh, she was Tree Flower on Angry Beavers, which I watched, and she was on Arrow Monsters, and she was on Friends. Yeah. And then I Googled you, and I was like, oh my gosh, he is a writer. And then that's that's how I broached it. It was on the next call. Right. Uh, and so I, because you, we owed you so much, Cynthia's like, no, I, let me, oh, my husband, well, he's happy to help you. He'll be more than happy to talk to you about <laughs> TV and screenwriting and all that stuff. And because of that, because of what you had done, your attitude, which was, let me give, give, give. Now we feel indebted to you and we want to help you back. And that's how you and I met. And that's how you ultimately broke into the business. Because I, I wound up getting you uh, jobs on two of the shows that I was on. Yep. Right? Yep. Yep. And that's how you got it. And it wasn't because you asked for, you didn't beg me. You didn't ask me for anything. You gave first and then I returned. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm, I, I am grateful for that. Again, none of that comes from a place of 
you owe me because I did. Right. Right. Look what I've done for you. It's simply what can I do? And to that same point on that first show where I was a, a PA, I was day playing as I've talked about on other episodes and they ultimately brought me in to be the office PA. And I did the same thing. I said, what skill sets do I have to serve the people above me? Like, how can I go in this extra time? And I approach it from this perspective again, like I'm not in a union. There's no one dictating what I can and can't do. And so ultimately I look at it as I have sold 12 hours of my day to these people. Mm -hmm. Like I have sold my time. They own me for 12 hours. So what can I do in the next 12 hours to be so productive that they want to keep me around? And I still get my bosses from that first job from Rhett and Link. They call me five years later and they offer me things. Right. Hey, and it's like, hey, my buddy asked me if I know someone who wants to have this job. No experience needed. They're willing to train. I thought of you immediately. Right. Right. That kind of stuff. Yeah. So Doors open that way. Right. Yeah. And so. You know, as I thought a lot about this, and we talked about this in your in your private group in your course um, recently, but there are some questions that I think of, and I would encourage anyone in this situation to go through. So, what can I do to serve this person, like whoever it is, like whether it's you know Carrie Clifford, who's a writer on on Tacoma FD, like she loves tuna, she absolutely loves tuna, but she's also very picky about her tuna, mm -hmm. and so I literally kept a whiteboard list of her favorite tuna places. So whenever I go around to get lunch. If it was her day to decide, I would remind her which place she liked her tuna from. Right, right. right. There's or little like, things, right. Yeah, like one of the writers like these very specific smoked um, pistachios from Whole Foods. So I would go out of my way to pick those up for him so that he had something he liked in the room. Yeah. And it's not it's not kissing butt. It's not sucking up. It's, again, how can I serve the, this person, right? Yeah. Because and it will help you. Yeah. Yeah. And that comes, that comes in, and that, exactly, that comes, that helps. It's, it's in your own best interest. To, to do stuff like that, right? But people don't think of it like that. They just no. don't. They think of it as, it seems like a lot of people think of it as how I'm being taken advantage of. Like yeah, or they think like, advantage of me. or it's also like, what can you do for me? I, I, I need you yeah. to help me. Help me break into Hollywood. Help me, help me, help me. Instead of the other way around, which is let me help you. Yeah, and so to, to answer that question, the next thing I would ask myself is, what are my unique skill sets? Right. What what are my hobbies, passions, and talents? Uh, what do I have that's valuable to my chain of command? Like thinking up the chain of command, whether it's, you know, I'm the writer's PA and I report to the script coordinator. How can I make the script coordinator's job easier? Mm -hmm. How can I do this? And, and I think this mindset, a really good way to think about this, I had the opportunity to speak at a, a business college a couple of years ago. And I sat in in the class. They just said, I did a presentation for some friends of mine about a business that I was managing at the time. And the professor said, the best thing you can ask in an interview is, how can I relieve a burden, this bur a burden off of your shoulder? What burdens can I relieve from your shoulders? Right. And it seemed a very formal way to think about it. But if you approach everyone above you with that mindset, like what burdens do you have? Like, how can I help carry some of the weight here? They will gladly give that to you. Yeah. Because it's and it catches people off guard too, because it's not likely. And so here's just a, an example of that. So for a wrap gift for season three of Tacoma, um, we got the idea of doing a yearbook. Well, I happened to be on the yearbook staff for two years in my high school. Like, and that was, I graduated in 2004, right? So mm -hmm. this was 2002, three and four that I was on the staff. I don't remember technically how to use InDesign. I've played a little bit with it since, but it came up and... I was well and told I had to do this. And someone was like, phone it in, just get a template offline. And there was a very low expectation of this. But what I said is, if I'm going to do this, just let me do it right. So I literally, we set up a photo booth. I brought my camera. I took photos of everyone on the staff. We had COVID there monitoring to make sure we were safe. I went through, I photo edited every single one of those. I built the design and the layout inside of InDesign. And I worked with um, Cindy, our, our second AD, who was taking photos of everyone all, see, all season. And we built an actual hardbound yearbook that we gave to every member of the staff. Right. And it was something that, you know, the people who were in charge of building these gifts, like the production supervisor, the, unit, the, the UPM, the uh, production office coordinator, they were grateful that I went the extra mile because it took something and leveled it up. Yeah. Right. But furthermore, and I think this is another key aspect, I went and did extra work to find a place where I could go and save them money, 
which enabled them to give these really cool heated jackets to everybody. Right. If you got one of those. Right. I did right. get one of those. Yeah. We had the ability to upgrade that to like a jacket with a heater in it because I was able to save like three grand on the printing costs by doing this extra stuff. Right. Right. I didn't know so that. So just little, little things that you know that you've, you know, acquired throughout life, they go a long way. Like I was listening to another podcast and there was another writer who said she went in into an, to an interview and she had done her research on IMDb and she's like, oh, I didn't know you wrote on this show. I really like that. And the writer's like, well, I actually didn't write on that. That's a mistake on my IMDb. Mm. And the writer was embarrassed. And then afterwards, she went and using her knowledge of IMDb Pro, fixed their lit their listings and then emailed them and say, hey, just want to apologize for my mistake. I just want to let you know I took care of it for you. Right. And she got hired on that show because she was willing to go the extra mile. Yeah. And she solved the problem for her boss. That wasn't even her boss. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah. People don't think like, it's, it, most people don't think that way. But if you can get into that mindset, like doors will open. Yeah. And, and like another example is like little things. Like one of the showrunners came to me and said, hey, I need to get 13 binders, three, three ring binders, one for every episode. And they're like, and I don't like the D rings. Give me a, a full ring. And so I just wrote down my notes. And then I went out and got them. And I I didn't know what color he wanted. And so I came back and I said, uh, what color do you want? And he said, um, I think I think he actually wanted a big binder at this time for just uh, the notes. Um, later, I, I, did, I got I got a lot of binders. He really likes binders and highlighters. Yeah. yeah. Like, but bold me, like I got these two binders. And I was like, I didn't know which color he would want. I got three. I got two black and one white. And he came out and said, which color do you want? He said, oh, I don't know, black. And I had it ready. I pulled it out and it already had all the separators. It had everything ready. And I gave it to him. And I remember he walked into the kitchen where you were and I overheard him saying, man, that guy is really good. Like he got it. And then you sang my praises to him. Yeah. Um, but it, like a little thing just, which is a, a stark difference than the previous PA who told him he couldn't have sushi when he wanted it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just to do it with a smile and do it just, yeah. And then all these doors open. Exactly. And so... Yeah, I think it's a wonderful... That's not just a lesson for Hollywood. It's just a lesson for life, I think, right? Yeah, and to your point, which you talk to a lot of people about, it's like, be nice to everyone because everyone knows everybody in a small town. Yeah. Like, these things get around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, so... Well, we any other thoughts about, like, paths to break into Hollywood? I know you've got a lot of content on your social media. You talk about, like, mailroom, which, you know, people accuse of being, like, an 80s strategy, like... Yeah. But it still people works. I know friends who've growing through the mailroom to become agents. Yeah, it's so like so I right, so I post I try to post oh, I, I think I do so far. A daily post on Instagram at Michael Jammin writer and I did a post about Hollywood had a break into Hollywood. And so I did one post about, you know, working in a mailroom in an agency and how that's a great way to break in. And then I got all these like trolls. I don't know if they're trolls or just jerks or whatever. They're just like, "Man, you know, you ever hear an email, dude?" I was like, "Well, how do parcels come?" When do parcels come through email or do they get delivered somewhere? You know, so the, just jerks, just trying to like, I, I don't know, like, okay, with that attitude, with that attitude, you're never going to get anywhere in life. Well, you've already, get, you've given up. Yeah. Right. If you're always looking at the negative, you've, you've given up on, you're not going to make it. Yeah. Because you've already decided you are. Right. You've already, exactly. And, and it's, it's self-fulfilling prophecy. There was one woman I, I had to post and she posted about how Hollywood is an awful place. And uh, people were, she was a PA. I, I mentioned it was this post about how to get a job as a PA. And she's like, uh, yeah, P, I was a PA. Don't listen to this guy. I was a PA. And these people were mean to me and they were obnoxious and rude. And like, listen, I don't know what show she was on. Maybe they were. Uh, maybe they were mean and rude to her. Okay, so go get a job at Starbucks. That's a job that's easier to make, get. You'll make the same amount of money. And I guarantee you, people will be mean and rude to you. The customers will be mean and rude to you. Either way, it's going to happen. So why don't you do it in the area that you want to advance in, in Hollywood? Like, what is your problem? Like, for okay, people are mean. That's that's life, man. So what? Do you want to get your goal? And then someone else had another comment. She was you know, wow, all that. I think it was a woman. All that just to become uh, for all that work and hard effort just to be a PA. It's like, no, it's not to become a PA. It's to become a writer or a producer or a director. Like PA, this is just a temporary job. Yeah. It's all this work for this temporary stepping stone. Yeah, you know, I had a really good conversation because I've been a PA for six years or so now at this point, and I'm thirty, I'm going to be thirty six this year, and I have a wife and kids, and you know, it's it it's a grind, and it can feel a little heavy. But in fairness, I, you you've had opportunities to do other production work, but you just don't want it because you want to st stay in the screenwriting path. 
Correct. I have turned down post-production coordinator jobs. I've I've done I've done some other stuff. I was a post PA on a te- on a film. I've, I've done other things. Right. But ultimately, the the niche I've carved for myself is writer because that's what I want to do. Right. And if other doors open beyond that after producing, directing, great. But right now, my purpose on this planet is to be a writer. Right. Right. So, um, I I lost my train of thought. It's because I interrupted you. But the point is that we were talking about how it's just it's just a stepping stone. And you've been doing PA for a yeah. while, but it's not because you have to. It's because you want right. to. Right. So, so I remember now. So I kind of brought, I kind of privately one night, so we're shooting super late. Um, it's like a Friday. We're going into a Friday day, which means you're shooting into Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. So your Friday, Saturday blend. Um, and I was like talking to one of my bosses about, you know, yeah, man, I'd really love to get that next step. I just don't know how to approach it. And they said, well, what you have to understand is that People see hard work and they see loyalty and they see effort and they reward that. Mm-hmm. And she said, it's important to know that, yeah, you're not asking for things, but there will be a time when you get an ask. And when that ask comes, make sure you ask for it. You yeah. have to put yourself out there. Yeah. But in general, you get the ask because you're not asking. Yes. And I was like, oh, and like, and, and it may not seem like it, but people reward hard workers because, yeah. and, and I think the word she said is we recognize what we have. And I was like, oh, that's a very kind compliment. But I think it goes back to this mindset of how can I serve? How can I serve? And I'm by far not the only person. The production secretary on our show and the other office PA, the exact same attitude mm-hmm. to the point that our boss at, on our last day when we wrapped and we we're closing up the stages, she said, I would be happy to work with you any other time on any other show. If you any of you need jobs, please let me know. Yeah, that's right? great. Because yeah. we all had that attitude. Yeah. And it made it easier because... We were all serving each other too. Yeah, yeah. So. It does. so good. We talked a lot. We got a lot of stuff in this. This was a an informative episode, I think. I this has been an episode of Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jamin and Phil Hudson. If you'd like to support this podcast please consider subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing this podcast with someone who needs to hear today's subject. If you're looking to support yourself, I'd encourage you to consider investing in Michael's screenwriting course at michaeljammon.com course. I've known Michael for over a decade, and in the past seven years, I've begged him to put something together. During the global COVID-19 pandemic, Michael had time, and I have to say, I wish I'd had this course 10 years ago. As someone who's personally invested in most online courses, earned a bachelor's degree, and actively studied screenwriting for over a decade, this course has been more valuable to me than most of the effort I've put in because it focuses on something no one else teaches, story. In his course, Michael pulls back the curtain and shows you exactly what the pros do in a writer's room, and that knowledge has made all the difference for me, and I know it will for you too. You can find more information at michaeljammon.com course. For free daily screenwriting tips, follow Michael on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Michael Jammin Writer. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Phil A. Hudson. This episode was produced by Phil Hudson and edited by Dallas Crane. Until next time, keep writing.